Donald Trump slams the Colorado show trial and Cash Patel takes the stand. Now Cash is going to tell us about this letter that was sent by Mayor Muriel Bowser the day before January 6th, declining the National Guard. And we're going to listen to expert witnesses who testified in Congress saying that the 14th Amendment absolutely applies to Trump and it's exactly for the type of conduct that Trump is allegedly involved in, which according to them is an insurrection. And then we'll hear from the Secretary of State who's got some pink hair, who's going to explain how this is all going to work in totality because they're going to say Trump cannot be literally on the form. He is disqualified from the form, so the Secretary of State can't process it because he's disqualified under the insurrection clause of the 14th Amendment. So, a lot to get to, but we're going to start off with Donald Trump, who is responding to this show trial, obviously and appropriately angry that it is even happening that a judge in Colorado is trying to deny people in Colorado the right to vote, the right to go in there and participate in what they lecture us all about about democracy all the time. The trial is currently taking place to try and illegally remove my name from the ballot. I often say that 2024 will be the most important election in the history of our country. The reason for that and that statement is that our country is being destroyed by people who have no idea what they're doing, or even worse, they may very well have an idea. They may hate our country and they may want to see it destroyed. But it may also be the last election we ever have. If this election doesn't work, if this election is rigged and stolen, if bad things happen, our country will not survive. If Crooked Joe and the Democrats get away with removing my name from the ballot, then there will never be a free election in America again. We will have become a dictatorship where your president is chosen for you. You will no longer have a vote or certainly won't have a meaningful vote. And you could say, frankly, that that has already begun. This truly is our final chance to save America. And with the 2024 election, now less than one year away. This is your chance to take a stand against tyrants that support the one and only movement that can save our country and make America great again. We must win in 2024. If we don't win, we will not have a country. If we do win, we will make America greater than it's ever been before. Thank you. He's right. We're going to be in big trouble. They were just getting warmed up in 2020. If they're able to recreate and redeploy that infrastructure, Structure. It's not going to be looking good. And Trump's lawyer, Christina Bob, is also chiming in on this, explaining the same that this is really harming the American people, many of whom want to vote for this man. Yeah, you're exactly. It's really particularly disappointing for the American people that are getting drugged through this emotional trauma of having to deal with this political theater. This case doesn't stand a chance at holding up at the Supreme Court at any we'll level of appeal. We'll see. Uh, the fact that they would even bring it is really disappointing, and it shows just how far the left is willing to go. And for example, you know, in this country, you're innocent until proven guilty. In order for them to actually try to have some semblance of a chance to remove him from the ballot, he needs to be guilty of an insurrection. Certainly, he has not been tried for that. But more importantly, he has not even been charged with that. There is no charge of insurrection on his January 6th case in Washington, D.C., or any of the other cases. So they're basically declaring him guilty with no trial and saying they're not going to put him on the ballot, if that's actually the way that this judge ends up ruling. All right, so we're going to listen to this constitutional expert. Now, he was in court all day on day three, a big portion of it, and just explaining how the 14th Amendment applies to Trump and how all Trump's activities mirror the Civil War and that the Reconstruction era brought about these new rules to stop insurrection. He was given all this historical context to try to say what happened on January 6th was basically the same thing as the Civil War, which is what these you know weirdos have been saying for years now. But this, we'll fast forward through all of his lecture and listen to the cross-examination of this from Trump's defense, because this is where we'll get and tease out a little bit more about the mechanics of what he says is how the 14th Amendment works. And so this this is the expert witness in Trump trial, Colorado removal. And is it just to understand sort of your definition of insurrection? In order to engage in insurrection, in your view, does that require an overt and voluntary act? Well, an overt or voluntary act would constitute engaging in insurrection. I mean, whether inaction could is just not something that was addressed, so history doesn't tell us the answer. Okay. 
in action, just to pause on this, the audio is bad. That is the court's audio, and I don't know what they're doing. They're not boosting their mics in the courtroom. They're boosting the questioner's mics, but not the witness's mics. It's bizarre. It's been day three now. Hello, call me. I'll drive out there. So he is being asked specifically, is it an overt act or a covert act? Does the person who allegedly is involved in insurrection, do they have to do it publicly and no, like noticeably, or can they do an insurrection secretively? And we're going to be mincing words in this vein to really unpack what insurrection means. And the question that he was also asking, which is very detailed, can inaction be insurrection? So certainly if you rally a bunch of people up and say, we're gonna take over the country and go steal the podium, we're gonna take over the country, right? That's an actual organized insurrection. But if if you don't organize all of that and you just don't do anything, okay, something is happening and you fail to act, are you a part of that insurrection because you fail to act because something else is happening? We're gonna break it down. Could someone engage in insurrection with an involuntary act? No. Okay. Could someone engage in insurrection with a secret act? Well, no, in the sense that there had to be some public action that was being, that was involved probably in the sense that there was a public use for, a public purpose to the insurrection. Yeah, I would tend to think not. So you'd agree with me that it requires an overt and voluntary act? Well, an overt and voluntary act would qualify, yes. Okay and that someone has to have a specific intent? Well, that's a question on which the sources don't give us a clear answer. The Attorney General's opinions do refer to intent. On the other hand, the cases don't. The cases, to some degree, could be understood as saying that awareness or knowledge is sufficient. And the reason I say that is because so does the actor who is being charged with insurrection, they're basically determining whether Trump committed an insurrection disqualified under the 14th Amendment. Let's say you had a sheriff okay, in a southern state. They were the sheriff before the Civil War. They maintained the same position during the Civil War and after the Civil War. So they were doing the same job the whole time. All that changed is, you know, they were in the United States, they were in the Confederacy, they are under the United States. It's not clear there is any intent involved, but they would have been disqualified because they had served prior to the war, now they're serving during the war, now they're still there after the war. It is clear that they were aware of the insurrection, right? But they, they were just doing the same job in the same way. So in other words, they didn't maybe have the specific intent to be an insurrectionist, but by continuing to be a sheriff in the in the change between the Civil War, they were generally insurrecting, right? Their intent was to work as a sheriff for the Confederacy, and so they, they had general intent versus specific intent. So applying that to Trump, does Trump have the specific intent to go and insurrect the country, or is Trump's general intent, which is to to, you know, cause a question and, and you know, do some things, is that enough to sort of lead us to an insurrection? And the fact that he didn't specifically say, I'm going to, you know, go insurrect the country, that's enough to meet the standard, to meet the threshold. And so he's given us his opinion on how we split that. So it's less that would constitute intent. So let me ask you, and it, I mean, because there's a couple branches of section three, right? There's the aid and comfort to the enemies branch, and there's the engage in insurrection or rebellion. Yes. Okay. So are you saying it's unclear whether or not that sheriff engaged in insurrection? It was deemed to have engaged in insurrection. Okay. My point was that you can't say that there's any specific intent involved there. That would help. Because he was exercising civil authority under the government of the Confederacy. In the same way that he did before and afterwards. Yeah. Okay. So as applied to Trump, um, Trump doesn't have you... either, okay? He doesn't have specific intent or general intent at all. He didn't intend to insurrect anything. There was no general intent to do any type of insurrection. He was saying fight like hell, just like everybody was. He was protesting just like everybody was. There was a riot that took place just like it's happened many other times before. We have people insurrecting the Capitol building. We had like two of them, you know, in the last month or so. So it's not even, including Jamal Bowman is even insurrecting Congress now. So what are they trying to do here? He, he, you know, he's trying to define it, but in my opinion, it's just kind of, well, Trump doesn't, doesn't meet either one of those thresholds, no matter how you splice it. You are familiar with Professor Kurt Lash. You two have, I think, either written an article together or served on a panel? Uh, we did a podcast together. Yes. Okay. And he recently wrote an article talking about the historical record of Section 3, correct? Yes. And you'd agree with me that he uncovered some aspects or some items within the historical record that were relatively new to scholarship? Well, yeah, I think every draft paper is able to do that. Yes. And that's just part of the advancement of scholarship. Each draft paper adds new information. Right. Okay. And and have you been in correspondence or spoken with Professor Lash since he wrote his paper? I have, yes. Okay. And that's a collegial relationship similar to the one you share with Professors Tillman and Blackman. Would that be fair to say? Yes. 
Okay. They actually wrap up here pretty soon, so we'll just close it out. So did I correctly hear it saying that you're not here today as an expert on the First Amendment? Correct. Okay. So you've not, for purposes of today, maybe at some other point, sort of done an analysis of what incitement means or the historical record behind no, that? I mean, there were no First Amendment cases from the Supreme Court until well after Reconstruction. So that's part of the reason why. Hmm. Okay. So basically, the historical record you looked at predates modern First Amendment law. Correct. All right. I have no further questions. Thank you very much. All right. Pretty simple. So that was the expert witness who came in, gave us a little bit of talk about the 14th Amendment. And again, I don't think it applies at all. But we'll see where this judge goes. And the judge, I think, is probably going to rule Trump is disqualified because that's just why we're here and going through all of this. But then we'll see what the Court of Appeals does. And I think the Supreme Court will ultimately weigh in on it. But I wanted to, before we get to Cash Patel, who testified, and he was refreshing our recollection about this letter that we've talked a lot about, which I think totally smashes the failure to act argument of so-called insurrection. I wanted to share this because this woman is walking us through with her hair, more than her hair, the format by which they will ultimately remove Trump. And so I know this sounds probably kind of mechanical and maybe a little irrelevant, but I don't think it is, right? She's walking us through the qualifications that are necessary in order to show up on the form. And when the judge says that Trump is so-called insurrectionist, it will disqualify him from the form. And then this will be the organization that practically removes him. Like these are the people who are going to be taking him off the ballot so that people in Colorado can't vote for him. Let me ask you a general question about forms. What role does the Secretary of State's office play in creating forms that are used by candidates for ballot access? The Secretary's office creates all forms that are used for candidates for state and federal office for ballot access. All right, turning back to the form itself, at the top of the form, do you see where it says office information? Yes. And what is the significance of that language? Well, generally at the top of each of our ballot access forms, we include information about the office being sought so that the candidate is aware they're completing the correct paperwork, but also for our staff in terms of processing that paperwork and verifying qualifications. And so underneath that office information, it says year of presidential primary election 2024. You see that? Yes. So presumably that year was also changed on this form, right? Yes, that's correct. And then it lists the political party for the candidate? Yes, that's correct. And then there's a section for qualifications for office. That's the you one. That? Disqualified. And what are the qualifications listed here? Qualifications listed here are age of 35 years, resident of the United States for at least 14 years, and now born U.S. citizen. And do you know where those qualifications came from? From the U.S. Constitution. And are you aware there are other qualifications for the president uh, that are contained in the U.S. Constitution? Yes. Turn your attention to about halfway down the form, there's a bolded word that says signature, and underneath that there's, it says applicant's affirmation. Can you read that affirmation? I intend to run for the office stated above and solemnly affirm that I meet all qualifications for the office prescribed by law. Furthermore, the information provided on this form is to the best of my knowledge, true and correct. Did it say insurrectionist on there anywhere? And how does a candidate submitting the form confirm that affirmation? That I'm qualified. And it would sign that affirmation and have that signature notarized. Notarized. And how does the Secretary of State's office view that affirmation when considering a candidate's qualifications? Can you tell me what you mean by that? Well, that affirmation states that the person meets all qualifications for office. So does the Secretary of State's office interpret that to mean more qualifications that are listed on the form? The well, qualifications listed on the form aren't intended to be an exhaustive list of mm. qualifications. 14th Amendment, they also consider. A candidate affirm that they meet every qualification for office, regardless of whether it's listed on the form. So is it fair to say that affirmation is like a catch-all affirmation? I'd say that's serious. And do you have similar catch-all affirmations for other non-presidential candidates on their candidate statement of intent? Every candidate would sign an affirmation that they meet all qualifications for the office they're seeking. If a candidate checks the boxes on the form under qualifications for office and signs the affirmation, what, if any, additional inquiry does the Secretary of State make? Do you take his word for it? Do you I investigate? I want to further investigate that affidavit. It's on its face, complete and accurate. And so based on that, would certify a candidate to office. 
They don't look into it. No investigation. You don't look if they're insurrectionists? Oh. And as you testified a moment ago, a Colorado voter could challenge that determination of the Secretary of State, correct? Yes, that's correct. Are you familiar with the- All right, so how do you change that? If somebody's qualified, they say, I'm qualified, I'm not an insurrectionist, I'm over the age, I reside here, I'm a natural born citizen, blah, blah, blah. Well, if they sign it, do you double check that? Do you call somebody and ask Nancy Pelosi if they're qualified? No, we take it on its face. And so obviously that's what's going to happen. The people can then file a petition to challenge the secretary of state to get them to remove it. That's what they're doing now. But you can see how the mechanics work. The judge will say, no, I find that there is a disqualification. It is not authorized because he is deemed to have committed an insurrection. And so even though it's not on the form, it's not an exhaustive list on the form and it's going to disqualify him regardless. So now we're going to get to Cash Patel. Now we're very familiar with Cash Patel here, done great work on many great issues. And he's going to walk us through this letter from Mayor Muriel Bowser and really not through the letter itself. So we'll hit the letter first before we hear from him. But this was about Trump asking if there could be National Guard deployed. And this was the response from January 5th from Mayor Bowser from Washington, D.C. So Trump sent a request over. Why don't we deploy some National Guard? Because January 6th is going to happen. There's going to be a lot of people here. Whole country's upset with the rigged election and we're angry. So we're going to be protesting. So maybe it's a good idea to have some extra personnel there. Don't you think so, Mayor Muriel Bowser? Well, she says no. As the law enforcement agency charged with protecting residents, Muriel Bowser sent this letter back over to the Trump administration, including Chris Miller, Jeffrey Rosen, and Ryan D. McCarthy from the Pentagon. Says, hey, by the way, as the law enforcement agency charged with protecting my residents, the Metro PD is prepared for this week's activities. We've coordinated with Capitol Police and Secret Service, all of whom are regularly available and prepared. This week, we've got additional logistics and support and unarmed members of the D.C. National Guard who are going to work under direction, okay? So this is the mayor saying, we're good. We got it. The D.C. government has not requested personnel from any other federal law enforcement, and so she says very clearly, to avoid confusion, we ask that any request for additional assistance be coordinated using the same process. Now, we're mindful that in 2020, MPD was expected to perform demanding tasks of policing large crowds. Unidentified persons cause confusion and so on. And we know that things could have been bad. This is the mayor speaking. To be clear, on January 5th, the District of Columbia is not requesting other federal law enforcement personnel and discourages any additional deployment without immediate notification and consultation with the MPD if such plans are underway. The protection of persons and property is our utmost concern and responsibility. MPD is well trained and prepared to lead law enforcement coordination and response to allow for a peaceful demonstration in the now, if you rewind the clock and we were there on January 6th, we covered, you know, the reaction live basically. And it was a situation where the Democrats were saying that Donald Trump was trying to like deploy people, deploy the National Guard to seize power, right? That was their counter response to this. No, we're not going to let Trump secure anything because then he's just going to seize control. So then they literally not only dissuaded Trump, but they denied him as Cash Patel is going to explain to us. They made the judgment that they couldn't act in the face of this. So if Bowser says no, then they're done. If Pelosi and the Senate and the House Sergeant at Arms say no, they tell Capitol Hill Chief of Police no, that's the end of the story. So now let's listen to Cash Patel. He's going to end up on that letter and he's going to walk us up, build us right to it. And let's hear what he says, testifying on behalf of Donald Trump in the Colorado ballot removal trial. This is Cash Patel. Did part of the process involve reaching out to the local authorities to see if they wanted National Guard involvement? Objection meeting. Normally, no. Normally the request would come in. But in this instance, the Secretary and I, along with others, felt this matter was important enough that we ordered the Secretary of the Army, after that authorization came in on January 3rd, to begin engagements with Mayor Bowser and the Capitol Police, who we had already been speaking to on other matters that we discussed here. And we wanted to make them aware that the President authorized 10 to 20,000 National Guard, and we wanted to ask them if they had a request. It sort of a was a proactive, preemptive measure. If they needed it, we could begin that big lift that is moving thousands of human beings across the country. What is your understanding of why DOD is reluctant to deploy National Guard without a request from local authorities? My understanding is historically how the department has operated is they do not want to deploy uniformed military officers into and around the United States without the appropriate legal authorities. 
because one of the bedrock principles of having a civilian in charge of the military is that there is no military sort of hijacking of local governmental offices and power. And I think that's the way, from my understanding, that the Department of Defense has operated its National Guard with that history in mind. And if the local authorities explicitly tell DOD that they don't want the National Guard deployed, what would DOD's reaction be? We, under our, uh, the advice of our General Counsel's Office, the White House Counsel's Office, along with other agencies and departments who all agree that absent a request, we would not move the National Guard process forward because we or our lawyers have made the determination that based in history and law and precedent, that that would not be an appropriate maneuver for the department to undertake unilaterally. They're not going to interfere. If Bowser said no, they're not going to override her. So the Secretary of the Army had reached out to local authorities, both in the D.C. government and at the U.S. Capitol Police. What was the response? I'll paraphrase, but I think the documents have been made public. Mayor Bowser wrote a letter herself approximately January 4th or 5th, I don't have an exact date, declining further requests for National Guard services outside of the 346 National Guard units over the center. And as far as the Capitol Police go, it's encapsulated in multiple people's timelines, including the chiefs, excuse me, testimonies from the chiefs of the Capitol Police and the Capitol Police timeline itself, where the sergeant at arms declined the chief right. of police's request for National Guard requests. And thus, those two were our answers as we understood it from the two government authorities as far as January 5th to January 6th. Okay, so just pausing on that. So not only do we have the letter from Mayor Muriel Bowser, the mayor of Washington, D.C., that's supposed to have civilian control. We don't want the DOD. We don't want all the Trump federal soldiers coming in and seizing the Capitol. So we leave it with them. Now, that's one avenue. Now, the other was security of the Capitol, which, of course, is under federal jurisdiction. And so they went, the same people, the Trump administration, went to Capitol Hill Chief of Police, Stephen Sund, who wrote a whole book about this, which is outstanding, by the way. Way, I would recommend it, who explained in clear detail that he made multiple attempts to make requests up the chain of command, sergeant at arms, and that that went over to Nancy Pelosi, and he was denied multiple times. And if you've listened to anything from him, okay, he's fired up about this, by the way, because he says he's made dozens of calls. He was scrambling around trying to put all this stuff out, but that's not what they wanted. Nancy Pelosi was thrilled. She says, we've been waiting for this. And they all apparently knew that there was going to be a lot of people there. And in my opinion, there were so many CHSs and undercover informants, confidential human sources. We also heard testimony in the Proud Boys trial that the cops were up there on the balconies of the Capitol shooting at a peaceful crowd with paintball guns, essentially, that were projectiles blowing people's cheeks open, right, before anything ever actually got bad. So they were instigating the crowd. There were undercover people in the crowd. There were no security there. I mean, for one of the most supposedly secure buildings in the whole stinking world, they couldn't figure it out. So now they're trying to blame Trump for that, but it was all a set up. Here's cash. Okay. Could you put up exhibit 1028, please? And I believe this is another one to which there's been no objection, but I do not believe it's yet been admitted. I would like to move that this one be admitted if it hasn't yet been. No objection. 1028. 1028. 1028 is admitted. And Mr. Patel, I would ask you if you recognize this letter. I do. And what is it? It's a letter from, excuse me, just scroll down. I just want to confirm that. Okay, thank you. The letter I referenced from Mayor Bowser, I believe on January 5th, to the Department of Defense, where she specifically stated, we would not be requesting any additional National Guards and women. And that was her letter to us. That was the declination of a request. And so we were on standby. There you go. That's it. Okay. Nothing else there to it. Now, that, I think, shatters their failure to act garbage because it is not a failure to act. They were actually doing their due diligence. In fact, had Mayor Muriel Bowser listened to them, maybe none of this would have happened. But they like that it happened because it has now been used to harangue Trump and like an albatross around his neck, it's walking itself all the way into 2024. And they can keep brainwashing their side of the country that insurrectionists are about to take over. So that is the latest of update on trial day three. We'll be back tomorrow with day four, and there will be a lot more to dig into. We know that Trump's defense is just getting started, and so we'll see where they go. Thank you, my friends, for subscribing and joining us as we continue to cover this trial, the rest of the Trump trials, and more going into 2024 and beyond. We'll look forward to seeing you back here on the next one.